All right, and we are back with another episode of On the Delo, and nothing like free intro music. Love it. Do you have free intro music? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't for it the sure. Best? It is. This came with the board. Nice. I like it. What kind of board do you have? I don't have a board like that. This no. is all fancy oh, stuff. Stop it. Seriously. <laughs> we were we were talking before you got on, and um, we were talking about just podcasting and how it's different. Like we're in person, which yes. is I, I don't I've never done a Zoom podcast. That's amazing. I, and I've only done Zoom podcasts. Okay. So you've never. And my a... own podcast is Zoom based. So. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. 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 But I guess you have like your routine. You just kind of know how you do it, right? Yeah, exactly. And then exactly. does somebody else kind of cut and edit it mm-hmm. for you? Yeah. yeah. Goes through all that. And um, all I have to do is record. Yeah. And then the rest gets done. That is amazing. Well, we are uh, 142 episodes in. Welcome, Susan. Amazing. Uh, it's you. kind of funny how things come back around. I, I want to, oh my God, I'm getting, so I'm 50 now. I think I met you when I was in my 30s. Really? Yeah, dude. Like, wow. wasn't I competing? Like, Yeah, you must have been because I was doing a little competing too. Right, that's right. <laughs> so I was 36. Wow. I'm 50. Now, here's what's ironic. Saturday, a day from today, I go compete again. No. Yeah, I'm getting on stage you're as doing a 50 it year old. Again? Oh yeah, I'm completely oh shredded God, right now. Oh my God, you're a rock star. Yeah, I, it's so stupid. Like I'm so <laughs> over it at this point. I know. But I had to do something at 50. <laughs> okay, so this was it. Yeah. You know, it's a good structure to really get dialed in on your health, and you know, it's a goal, great goal to have. I started it when I was going through my divorce. Yeah. Um, and it gave me something else to put my attention on, rather than dealing with this like contentious divorce stuff, right. I could focus, something I could control and focus on and work towards, and that's why I did it originally. Did you enjoy the process, or did you enjoy the event itself, or both? I think initially I enjoyed both. Yeah. I think over time, I did it four times. By the fourth time, I did not enjoy the event itself, and part of it was most of the fun is backstage. Yeah, It's celebrating, and A lot of these women were so worried about getting up on stage. And I kept saying, who cares? You've already won. Yeah. Like, you walk out on stage and you've put in all of this effort. And it's not like you're getting paid for this. No. So why do you care so much? Like, whatever happens is going to happen. So I I generally had a blast backstage. But I wanted people to have fun with. And the last time I did it, it... no one was having fun. Nobody it's just was like, having this is fun. dumb. Right. And, and we shared a mutual trainer, which was Karen Malarkey. That's right. Yeah. And so that's who you did your shows with, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. She's amazing. Over uh, Maximum Fitness, which is crazy. There's a whole history within that place yeah. within itself. So speaking of history, like, are, where are you from originally? Is it Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. That's okay. right. Yeah. So, so you're a big um, a Browns fan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first thing I remembered about you was about the Steelers. Yeah. 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 Love the Steelers. It's it's just part of, you know, you're you're born with it. It's my family's connection. My mom, who's going to be 90 wow, this year. Wow, congrats. Amazing. Wears black and gold on Sundays and puts the, the terrible towel over the television. It's like their whole shrine and everything. So it's so fun as a family to connect over these sports teams and cheer them on together. Yeah, I like that. Um, I want to talk more about connections in a little bit, but let, before we get into that, like, when did you come to Arizona and what was like the, the start of your life and your journey here? Yeah, 2008, okay. I moved here with my now ex-husband. He took a job. I moved from New York. I was living in New York at the time for at least 10 years. Yeah. So it was a big change coming from Manhattan to Scottsdale, Arizona. Oh, I'm sure. And um, but within a year, we split up and I stayed and he went back to New York. So I built a whole new life here. Really? So what what made you want to stay here? Did you just like it here? Well, yeah, I think I was done with New York. I mean, it's hard living in Manhattan. I love it for a lot of reasons, but I, I needed something different. This was a whole new chapter of my life that was opening up. And I really like the sun. Yeah. I know. Once you get a, a fix, it fixated on, like, the sun and the heat and all that stuff, yeah. it's hard to move back to the cold. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. even the summertime is as brutal as they can be. And you used to spend, and you still may do, do you go um, to, like, uh, Park City or? I've done all different things during the summer. So I do, I have the ability to go where I want during the summer. Yeah. And uh, I've been to San Francisco. Four years I had a place in San Francisco, Jackson Hole for a while. Um, I've been in Park City. 
uh, this this summer I spent in on the East Coast. So it's nice because I get to explore other parts of the country. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, you're very smart. Okay. No, I like. <laughs> I mean, people do your background research on this on this lady. She is very smart. So it's kind of it's interesting to me because. I would I would depict you as like a type A probably probably yes I would say that I would I'm 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 driven I get that from my mom yeah but I think there's different forms of intelligence so thanks for saying that I I in my mind I see you have I've got an intelligence in one area and I don't have intelligence in some other I like give me a financial spreadsheet to go there like I don't want to go there right and I think so I really believe there's different forms of intelligence and I the key is to knowing what yours is right and I think for me what I've discovered over the years is I'm really good at pattern recognition and then pattern disruption okay and in fact I built my whole leadership coaching programs based on this idea yeah and I think it's important to sort of determine what your superpower is but Given how did I do well in school and go to fabulous schools that I uh, did? Yeah, like what school is that? What you want to name it? Harvard Law School. Yeah, I no did shit. Go to Harvard That's Law. why I said that. Like, wow. And yeah. I didn't even know that. I've known you for so many years. I didn't even know that until I did a little research on you. I'm like, Harvard, really? Like, Susan, really? Like, I You're partied like, I with you. Know. I've like, cracked <laughs> beers on your head, I think. I, I don't even remember back when I drank. Right, right. But uh, but I like that. I mean, uh, c what you talk about is brilliant in the aspect that everybody has, like, their own superpower. Yeah. And when they find it and it resonates with them, they're able to use that to their fullest ability. That's a gift. Totally. I mean, that's how I got into law school. I took eight practice tests. And I could see the patterns of the types of questions that they were asking. I didn't do one of those courses. I just took eight practice tests. I could see the patterns. <laughs> and then I only missed two on the entire test. Oh, my God. Because of that. And I didn't even realize, like, this was my superpower until, yeah. like, in the last, I don't know, couple of years. Okay. Once I realized, um, I use a couple different tools to help people recognize and disrupt patterns. One of which is music, which we'll talk about. Yeah, which is my De book. definitely. Another one is the Enneagram. Are you familiar with the Enneagram? I have a book right now. I'm, re I'm a number seven in the Enneagram. Same. I, I love it. Same. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it helps people see the patterns and what motivates them, but right. also the patterns of their blind spots. So I'll, u I'll use that tool a lot. And at one point when somebody who didn't really believe in that tool and I would, I would just ask a few questions, and I'm like, well, probably this is happening, and this is happening, and this is happening. And they're like, oh my God, did you talk to my wife? I'm like, nope, I just know the patterns. Yeah. And the person who, who was like, oh, this tool, whatever, he was like, you're just world class at pattern recognition. And there was something about when he said that to me, I was like, huh. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Maybe that is, and then then I started reflecting on my life and these different pieces, and I was like, huh, maybe this maybe this is my superpower, and I never do it. That's beautifully said. Let's talk about pattern recognition because now you got me really thinking. So I'm going to try and articulate this and as intelligently as I can as a. So I'm I'm a talker. Like I'm an idiot when it comes to like writing things. Like you know even even writing my book. This was all dictated and somebody else really had to write it per se. But it's my words, right? Yeah. yeah. So we, we all have our strengths and, and and mine is talking and and being outgoing and doing the things that I do within an, what a number seven does. Now how many enneagrams are there? They're nine. There's nine okay yeah. so think about this people there's nine possibilities that every single human being in the world fits into am i am i right it's it's a possible now there's only one you and you are super unique yeah it's more the way i use it is it's your leadership style and what it you know as human beings we think we can see 360 degrees like a chameleon right but we can't we have a central vision and a peripheral vision and where we point our focus of attention, that's what we see. The Enneagram shows where you tend to look, mm -hmm. your pattern of where you tend to go, where you tend to go. But there's something behind your head you can't see, and that's your blind spot. Mm. And I think it starts to illuminate for people what their pattern is on what they pay attention to. You know, there's, I don't, I don't remember, it's like 64 billion bits of data coming yeah. at us every day. We see such a fraction of that, yet we think we see the whole thing. Right. You don't. And the Enneagram helps point out what's that pattern of what you tend to focus on and yes. pay attention to, and what do you miss and not pay attention to. So information you dial up 
and information you dial down. That's really cool. I uh, I was told while somebody was teaching me about this, I have a I have several coaches myself, physical and mental. And it's just a healthy, and I'm in a blessed area of life to be able to have this sort of thing. But one of the things he was telling me is that you are not your thoughts. Like you literally, when a thought comes to you, you can observe it, you can take it, and then you can be like, okay, cool. I recognize that you're here. I'm thinking about you, but that's not who I am. So bye-bye, you know, if you don't want Yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, I and mean, that takes mastery, right? Yeah. It's, it, because we we identify with our work. We identify with our thoughts. We, we just identify. Yeah. And there's an opportunity for you to be the observer and zoom out. And that's essentially this ability to zoom out, see the patterns, see the patterns that your team has, right? And as a leader, be able to point those out as patterns and shift the patterns. That's going to be a lot more efficient than trying to maneuver little bits of actions, right? Yeah, completely makes sense. Before, okay, before we get into Meritage and your coaching and what you're doing now, how did you get there? What were you doing before? Because you have a, a really good, like, history of really cool stuff that you did. Yeah, I I have a very eclectic background yeah. right, in doing this work. So I, um, as I mentioned, I went to law school, but I figured out pretty early that I did not want to practice law. Right. <laughs> And I didn't know what I was going to do because I had so much loan debt. And this is, yes, I'm dating myself now. Back in 19, I graduated in 1995. Okay. And with that much loan debt, I had over $100,000 at that time. That was a lot. I knew I had to, I felt like I had to go into law right. to get one of these like sweatshop law jobs. <laughs> and I was just dreading graduating. I love learning. But I started taking classes at the Harvard Business School at the same time and transferring them over because I had a business undergrad degree. And I decided I'm going to go into something that an MBA would do, which is get into management consulting. So I went from there into BCG, mm -hmm. Boston Consulting Group, and that was one of the first years that those firms were interested in hiring lawyers. Okay. They, we were called the non-traditional hires. Right, right. right. And um, I was one of the first in that class to do that. But what's interesting is law teaches you, in each step of the way, which I'll, I'll describe, each one of these steps gave me something that I use now. So going to law school, the skill that they teach you is how to make finer and finer distinctions. The use case is for case law. Right? Why this case applies, why this case doesn't. You get very good at arguing yeah. these things, right? But I use that same idea of making distinctions, but I apply it to mindset now. Oh, okay. Right? How to make finer and finer distinctions of mm -hmm. mindset. So it's the same skill, just applied differently. I went from, so I went, when I graduated, I took the bar in New York in case I ever wanted to go back to law, but I never did. Yeah. So don't ask me a legal question. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I went from there to BCG. I worked there for a couple of years and got strategy consulting and, and process redesign and all this stuff. But I found, like, after a while, some of the projects I were on, it just weren't that interesting to me. I remember I, remember I had this project on hydroelectric turbines and oh. what's the market for that and I don't know. I just didn't care. Yeah. There's no passion behind it. There was no, I just couldn't, it just felt like drudgery, right? And I was just, oh, well, I don't know. It's interesting in the fact that you get a new case and you're learning a new industry every time. But I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe what I need to do is go get out of consulting and go work for a company in an industry that I'm excited about. Right. So then I decided I was going to go to, and I always had this interest in theater and entertainment. And so I went to work for NBC Television in marketing and business development. How but cool. I came in, the way I got in is um, they used to be owned by GE, who yeah. had this Six Sigma program. Have you heard of Six Sigma? I have, yeah. And so it's almost like an internal consulting position is what I got. But my title was Black Belt. <laughs> <laughs> and then I became a Master Black Belt, nope. literally on my business card, oh. Master Black Belt. Yeah. Okay. And, and, but the thing is, while the industry was really interesting, what I was doing, if you know anything about Six Sigma, it's about finding, doing regression analysis to find variation in processes. Right. Well, I would say the, the one B I got in college was in statistics. It's not my favorite thing to, yeah, to no, be looking at. No. And it is so not my personality. But I thought, oh, okay, like I could do this. And, 
And um, But what I also found is you can have the best process in the world, but if the culture doesn't support it, you're right. dead in the water. Yep. So here's NBC going, why do we want this manufacturing-based process? Like, we're an entertainment company. We're not GE Aircraft, right? Yeah. And... And so I do, it was very frustrating, but eventually what I learned is how can I take interesting information like Nielsen data and make it really valuable so that we're still using data, but we're using it in a way that the sales and marketing divisions had never used it before. And this was at the time that uh, the pharmaceutical companies were just coming online to be able to advertise on TV. Oh, my God. So that's when I gave them, I did a bunch of analysis and I gave them the data that said, Here's how you can pitch, you know, why being on NBC News is going to be far more powerful than not. And they right. love that data. So it was a good exercise about how do you measure what feels like it's unmeasurable. Like, yeah. And I think in leadership development today, that's really important because a lot of people are like, well, I could just tell he's not a good leader, but I don't know how I measure that. And I try to bring in a lot of tools that give you that data so that you have measurable tools like 360s, understanding background, like EQ tests, right. all the psychometrics that will help people really get a handle and use data for that. Well, look, I think 99 point nine percent of the business out there are just not measuring shit yeah no no really they're yeah. flying by the yeah. and they're successful by their however they are and when i look at like we just talking about earlier as we were talking about me doing a fitness show like i wouldn't be doing it if i didn't measure and track everything that went into my pie hole for the last three months or else i would go and embarrass myself on that. the product would not be the product right yeah. yeah whereas imagine if these companies just took a little bit of the time to figure out a system and a process to create the measurable data data to understand where they were, where they're at, and where they're going, how much more successful they would be. Yeah. But to your point, the people that are a part of that community or that company, they have to be on board with it. It has to be relatable. Yeah, it yeah. has to be relatable. And so after a while, I decided, gosh, I just don't know what I want to do. And yeah. I got married and ended up moving to London for his job. Okay. And I thought, I am just burnt out. I'm five years out of law school, and I'm right, burnt out, and I don't right. know what I want to do. And I decided, oh, I just want to pursue something I've always wanted to do. And so I went, and I got a master's in acting from did. the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Oh, my God. And it was amazing. Wow. I loved it. I loved it. I it told was, you folks she's smart. It was just incredible. Yeah. It was just inc It was a Shakespeare-focused, but um, some of the classics like Chekhov and Restoration Theater. But here's the thing. And people thought I was crazy. And I kind of thought I was crazy, too. Yeah. But I thought, well, when else am I going to get this chance to do this? And let me see if this lights me up. Yeah. And it did. It did, yeah. Right? It did. But um, I ended up, what you learn as an actor is how to really connect to your fellow actor, mm. how to deal with that inner critic, that voice inside your head. Because if you're not dealing with that, you're going to be distracted by, like, the guy who's on his phone in the first row or right. when you're on stage, that yeah. kind of thing. How do you stay focused, connected, um, deal with that inner critic? And I kept thinking this authenticity piece is really big, too. There's got to be a way I could bring this to business. But I didn't know exactly what that would look like. And I came back, after I graduated, came back to New York. I pursued acting full-time for about a year and a half. No kidding. A little, yeah, a yeah, year and a half to two years. But in that process, I also did um, landmark education. And this is back in 2002. Okay. So, um, and that just blew my mind because it was really about human potential and human development. And I thought, bringing the acting, bringing this piece that you could really change people's perspective and their belief systems yeah. for a whole new world to open up. I want to do this in business. So that's when I got into looking at, well, what kind of career does that? And that's where I found leadership development. So I have been doing this for over 20 years. 20 I've been a coach years. for, I mean, when people didn't even know, like, you do what? Leadership development? Like, what is that? Right. You know? What does that mean? Yeah. Um, and I started with a firm um, that was a boutique leadership development consulting firm. And okay. I learned a lot of the basics. And then I went out on my own in 2006. And I've had my own firm ever since. Ever since. Yeah. And so the firm that you're in now is yours. And mm -hmm. how, how does that model work from a business perspective? Like, you have employees? Do you have a whole backlog? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I have a... Um, an internal team that helps with the programs and designing them. 
um, of about, I think we're at like seven people now. Cool. Um, and then I have a network of coaches that are in my cadre that are trained in the assessments that I use and in the modeling that we do in the program. So I will be a coach matcher often yeah. where I'll meet with the executive and figure out who are the best coaches based on what they need and then you know give them a choice of two and they they pick from there I still at times do some coaching but I only do I only take about five clients at a time now because I've got to run the business not just do the coaching but I still yeah like a little bit of the coaching because it's I find a lot of fulfillment in that what what's the what's like the most satisfactory thing that you get on a day in day out basis and what was what's been like the biggest struggle to to build this up and get to where you're at now to be able to do what you want to do yeah well one of the things I mean I love coaching because it you can't plan for it right. you don't know what they're going to bring yep. and it has as you listen and be present in a way that it's almost like any other com like unlike any other conversation and I almost feel like I'm downloading some amazing no, stuff I love that. you know yeah. you know yeah. that um, old school when Will Ferrell uh, gets up <laughs> to the podium and he has to do the debate and right. all of a sudden he says this brilliant stuff and yep. he's like where did this come from yeah. like I feel that energy all the time and it's magical for me because yeah. I'm like I don't know where that came from but they're like that's great oh my god yes but I think so. it's the same I think it's the same um, how do I say uh, energy or, or, or downloading that you have as a person that was able to create the coaching style that you have yeah and, and talk about your book and how music parlays into that and and a question on top of that is when did you know or have that first um, cognitation of being in love with sound with music knowing that it resonated with people and created that interconnectivity yes yes so the book the book's called the Leader Leaders Playlist, yeah. and it is how to use music to actually interrupt awesome. patterns yeah. and create new ones because of the research I did behind how music impacts the brain. Mm -hmm. It is like a fertilizer for forming new neural pathways to allow change to stick. So if you want to make a change in your life, if you pair that with music, it's going to happen a lot faster. Wow. So I bring this process in to help leaders see, first of all, what is the old playlist that's getting in their way. What is that pattern? And then how can we shift that, use music to interrupt that pattern, and then use music to create a new one. And I would say, where did it all start? I've always loved music. I, um, My mom, my dad used to play like four different instruments, and I have also a musical ear like my dad, but I, as a seven, I think my mom said, you're, you're too flighty. You know, I didn't want to sit down and learn an instrument. I was too, yeah. like I had ADD. To, yeah, I just had to keep moving. <laughs> and um, I wish I had now, but I think I've always loved music. I used to sing when I was younger. And I think I have this knack for knowing the words of Almost every song is bizarre. If the song comes on, I'll know the you words. You know the word. You're one it's of those. weird. That's crazy. I don't. I might not remember the artist or even the name, yeah. but I somehow know the words. There's something about what music does to me. Yeah. So, um, but I discovered this process when, for myself, when I'd gone through a pretty traumatic breakup um, of a relationship that lasted five years, and it was there was pieces of it that were just cutting to the core and some of it was around betrayal and every time I thought about this I would get in this loop of resentment and I knew as a coach that's not serving me I gotta break free of this right yeah. like don't but I, it, it's sort of like I was trapped in you're it, human right? I yeah. was in this loop of resentment and I was like finally I was like I gotta stop stop how and what I I decided to do is I found a song that would just interrupt that. Mm. And that what uh, that one song became a whole playlist. So it started with Bruno Mars' 24 Karat Magic. Yeah. There's just something about that song. I just love it, love it. And and when I did that, I couldn't be in the energy of resentment. It was like the party has started yeah, and here I am. Right, right. right. So any time I felt myself starting to go, I'm like, nope. Nope. I would either think of the song, think of Bruno Mars dancing, think of, or actually play the song if I could. It just depended on yeah. the, their circumstance. And then I was like, I'm going to build out a whole playlist. So I cr created this playlist called I Am Empowered. And I created this whole playlist of songs that did a similar thing to me that just gave me this energy. And I would play it to start my day. And I would play it when I was out hiking. And the more I practiced this, the more that became my dominant vibration. Mm. Because here's the trick. Wow. We are all vibration. Yes. Everything here is vibration, right? 
so is music. So if we want to tap into the vibration of music to shift our vibration, that's how we do it. And emotions have vibration too, right? So emotions can actually, they can actually measure some of the vi um, uh, vibration of emotions. Right. Your, your heart is the largest source of electromagnetic activity in the body. Heart right? math. Heart math. Yep. So three feet from your body, it can be measured. Yeah. Well, they can also measure those emotions and emotions such as joy and gratitude, they have higher frequencies than emotions like shame or anger. Those have lower frequencies. So why not use something that's like turbocharged, which is music, the ability to shift that state when you need it. Yeah. We don't just have to use it to work out, right? right? So I th th I just love this because I'm such a huge fan of of music and even like self promoting. Even in my book, I write about music, how it's affected me um, throughout my whole life, how it's been my love my whole life, and the nostalgia effect. And basically, the nostalgia effect, like when you're in your 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, you're, you're old enough to have experience now, you revert back. I don't care who you are. You will revert back to what you listened to when you were a child if you had good memories, and you'll pull that out. And so in context, like I'm, I'm a butt rocker. Like I love my rat and my warrant and my yeah, van. Yeah. That's the stuff that gives me the energy. And literally, no, I, I really don't have bad days because I choose not to anymore. But you, you have moments of time where you lose sight of all all the stuff going on that you don't really want to deal with or hear yeah, about and yeah. you put that on and it just creates a better day. Yeah, for sure. And it's not to say, look, b those darker emotions are not bad per se. Right. They're important information. Like anger gives us information that a boundary has been crossed I love that. or yeah. a value has been dishonored. Yep. So the gift in that is to take action based on that. So you want to be able to feel the anger if yeah. it's coming up for you. What I'm really talking about is when you get trapped in the pattern yep, the loop. of anger, right? You don't want to be on the I am pissed off playlist. No. Like that, you know, and, and, and I know people who are stuck in that playlist. Yeah. It's almost like, what's the flavor of the month this week that you're going to get pissed off about? Right. Ah, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, we're going to we'll definitely put a, a link to the book. And, and I want to share that and make a snippet out of that for sure. Let me while I have you here, what um, what would you say is the most common mistake that executives make? Well, I guess recognizing that the patterns that they're stuck yeah. in and being more aware that what they're doing is a pattern. And if they're feeling stuck, you need to try to zoom out a little bit and look at the thread. Where else has, what, what emotions are you feeling about? Whatever that circumstance is right now, where else in your life have you felt that? Yeah. And see if you can see, kind of zoom out to see the pattern in your life and get real curious about how you might go about shifting it. So that's that's the main thing. And, and if you have a coach, that coach can certainly have an unbiased opinion that kind of help you take you out of that loop. Because if you're, yeah. you're just stuck, if you're just stuck, if you don't have anybody to kind of help you get out of that, it's tough. Right, right. It's hard to see when we're in a pattern yeah, sometimes, right? right? So I try to give tools for self-discovery on that. And of course, you know, working with someone helps a lot. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, so you, you, you're busy, you're running a business. You're, you're you're coaching. You wrote a book. You're you're an EO too, right? Yeah, still yeah, 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 yeah. Christina's a good friend of yours, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I grew up with her actually. Oh like, my gosh, it was so funny. Wow, long history there. But um, what are some of your non-negotiables day in and day out for you personally? So as a busy entrepreneur yeah. and getting shit done, and yeah. you know wanting to have a life here, and I, you know, I mean, what relationship? All these sorts of things. So like, what are the things that you have to do for yourself to fulfill you before you can deal with everything else? Um, number one, I need to meditate before okay. I start my day. Like that is, and I never used to be able to do it because, you know, as a seven, it's the squirrel brain. Right? Oh, yeah, it's going, yeah. going, 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 going. So define meditation. Is it wearing a headset and listening to music and just kind of laying there in stillness? Is it just total No, quietness? I do um, Vedic um, meditation, which is mantra based. Yeah. Okay. So uh, focus on mantra. And I never thought I'd be able to start. Now I can't even, I can't start my day without spending 15, mm. 20 minutes just getting quiet focusing on the mantra and that's where I start and then the second piece that needs to happen is working out so I I do something yeah. five to six days a week and that could be and I always alternate it right because I don't want to just do the same thing so it's, right. it's Pilates it's yoga it's running it's hiking it's you know all different 
forms of moving my body because the rest of the day I'm probably I'm going to be sitting at a desk staring at a screen. So yeah. I better unless I'm speaking or facilitating. But if I don't do that and I can't simmer this down enough, yeah, for sure. So it's I got to get all my you know crazies out. Yeah. And then I can sit down and do it. Being outside, getting your son, feeling good, probably yeah. listening to music while you do it. Walking I mean, my dog. Yeah. Walking your dog. What kind of dog do you have? Toy Aussie. The Aussie. The Aussie the best family. In the, the world. best. I know. I remember, I remember stalking you on social media. I'm like, gotta get the Aussie. Yes. Gotta get the Aussie. I was when I was looking at dogs and I saw your dogs and yeah. I'm like, how are they? What do you think? Jersey and Leia, they're the best. I did not lie to you. No, so good. That's so, so good. funny. Um, as far as like, uh, you just your food habits are you just pretty straightforward just one ingredient kind of indulge every now and then or yeah i mean i do a little indulging every day with a little chocolate there that's you my go. that's indulging. my wife yeah yeah um but yeah i usually have an omelet in the morning yeah. you know some type of egg thing i have almond butter and then salad for lunch usually so right. i don't mix it up too too much during the day and then dinner could just be Whatever it's going to be. Whatever it's going to be. I don't. I don't tend to have a lot of carbs. I'm more protein and veggies. But yeah. but sometimes, and then, you know, I've got my little peanut butter cups and things like that. Oh, just it, to exactly. like little treats. Believe it or not, people love to hear this stuff. I mean, it's just so funny. Everybody's always interested in what other people eat, especially yeah. when they're busy and they're successful or they're in shape. It's like, God, I wonder what they do. And it's like, <laughs> it's really no different than what the average human probably should be doing. But we just, yeah. we get so caught. I mean, I was a year and a half ago, I was 20 pounds heavier. I was 10 pounds. I was a 10 percentage wow. body fat. And and I still wasn't that big. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you would have yeah. looked at me and said, oh, yeah, whatever. But, like, there's just a, you know, a mindset shift that happens when you change things. And you go out to eat a lot and socializing. Yes. And I'm sure your life has changed quite a bit to where you probably don't go and party as much. or Definitely not. Yeah. I mean, I do love a glass of wine, but it doesn't seem to like me after 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meaning, well. like, if I'm going to have it late, I'm not going to sleep. So I better be really clear that <laughs> yeah, this that is a special occasion for that to happen. I, I, I go to bed at, uh, at, what is it, eight every night, like religiously. Yeah. And I'm up at four. Yeah. See, that's great. I'm up, I'm about nine to five. Yeah. It's uh, it's too funny. It's not the same. It's so funny you brought up the Enneagram. I actually even had it in my notes here or whatever. So, all right. So tell me, um, before we get into rapid fire questions, what are um, like the different um, avenues that people can be coached by you? Like you, obviously you have like classes people can buy. Yeah, you have a yeah. book people can read that you have one-on-one -on -one coaches. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so there's... If you're interested in understanding your Enneagram type, but not only understanding what it is, but how you apply that to be a better leader or human, yep. um, I have a course that's called Enneagram Applied. And it both gives you an assessment, a very high-powered assessment, because nice. unfortunately, there's sort of pluses and minuses. No one owns the Enneagram, which I love. That's right? cool. It's, yeah. No one owns it. But then there's a lot of like crappy assessments out there that are sort of free or cheap that don't really... They do more harm than good because I've seen them mistype people so many times. And it's not helping you to understand the path of your growth if yeah. it's not clear which type you are, right? right? And Enneagram is a little bit harder to understand or to type because we're not looking at behavior. We're looking at motivation. So it's the why. Not what you do, but why, why you, you do, do it. it. Yeah. And that's, that's just a little bit harder to type. So we use an assessment that's really, really accurate, like 95% accurate. And, um, and then really show you what does it mean? What's the path of growth? And who can best support you in that growth? So yeah. there's those types of programs. I do the same thing with teams as well, where I take a team. There's a dominant team style. What does that mean for your team? What actionable steps can you take to improve team performance? So there's another course that where you, as like a leader, could do, facilitate yourself. We'll give you all the tools. We'll give you a little coaching, and you could run your own team offsite off of nice. that. That's called Leadership Edge. And so these two things are ways that I would say I've learned to scale my business because you asked me that question earlier, like what's been the most challenging is like, how do I, how do I scale yeah, this? Yeah. Right. And all the content that I've developed over the years around it. Well, that's one way. And then the other way is obviously working, um, you know, working with, as a team, we do team coaching and team engagement work. 
as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching and getting curious about what is it that you want in terms of coaching and then which type of coach would be most beneficial for you. Love it. That's great. Well, yeah, we'll put all this so people have access to it. Um, that's really cool. All right, we're going to do rapid-fire questions. Okay. But before, you want to do a shot with me? Okay, yeah, let's do it. It's the only shot that I do now. So this is a new product. So this guy, speaking of music, this guy came out, the guy that invented this shot, and I have a charity called Healing Hospitality. We give back to the mm -hmm. hospitality community. He invented this shot, but he also does music at 548 megahertz or whatever it is, and you meditate to the music oh, while nice. it's going yes. on. It was great. So that's awesome. Anyways, Magic Mind. Um, it's for cognition, for energy, Ooh. and for less stress. Shoot it up. Mm. Mm. Pretty good. It's good, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. So I got it here for the office so that all their Magic Minds can get going. All right. What's the... Um, what, what would you consider the biggest, um, let's just say, treat that you like to give yourself on a monthly basis? Uh, a massage. A massage. Yeah. Perfect. Where's your favorite place? My favorite place? For, yeah. Well, I have somebody that will come to my house. Oh. My favorite place is my house. Your house. <laughs> there you go. That works. I know. Kim and I love that, too. Like, come on over. Um, do you check email constantly? I uh, probably check email four to five times a day, probably too much. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Steelers or Pirates? Steelers. Okay, you're a football fan. Yeah. Walk or run? I like running, but yeah. I like walking, so we'll take both. Okay. Um, carbs or fats? Hmm. I guess fats. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fats are good. Yeah. Almond butter. Yeah. Oh, come on. Uh, lake house or beach house? Lake house. Okay. Mm-hmm. 1960 Chevy or 2024 Tesla? Tesla. Okay. You drive, I have one. Are you driving one now? <laughs> uh, I love this car. I've never loved. I've never loved a car so much as I love this Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a trick one. A mini Aussie or a mini Aussie? Hmm. <laughs> mini Aussie. <laughs> uh, breakfast or dinner? Ah, oh, breakfast. Okay. And would you rather go in Elon Musk's uh, spaceship, or would you rather go way deep down in the ocean? Probably the spaceship. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm kind of on the same boat. Yeah. And then what's your like? What's your what's your music of choice now? What are you listening to as far as like any like retro stuff that you like that's come back into your into your brain waves? Yeah. Right I I love. Gosh, I love so many different types of music. Um, one singer I love is named James Morrison. Not Jim Morrison, yeah, but James, James Morrison. Okay. And he's got this really, uh, I think he had throat cancer or something, and it, it's done something to his voice. He's got this very raspy, yeah. and I'm saying, it's like a powerful it's voice, neat. though. Um, I could be wrong on that. I'm not sure. But something happened yeah. to his, his vocal cords that made them really unique. And I and I, he's a singer-songwriter. That's what you're into him. now. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. Well, this has been cool. I appreciate you coming by. Um, we're going to put all your info in the show notes, and we'll get it out there in YouTube world Thank and all you. the other worlds, and we'll share it, and we'll do some other stuff. Um, everybody watching, please subscribe. And definitely follow. I am releasing my book. My book release party is November 1st. Exciting. And here it is. Yay. You know, it's like actually got pages and words in it, uh, which is exciting for me. Uh, but the, again, going back to the nostalgia effect and going back to things that we can be doing now. When I turned 50, I was like, wow, I, I feel like I was just born. Like, because you, you know enough to be knowledgeable enough to be like, God, I want to do this, this, and this, because yeah. I know this, you yeah. know? And and then, you you know, if you've been blessed enough and worked hard enough, you have enough money to do certain things, and, you know, if you're healthy enough and you've taken care of yourself. So this is what it's about. It's about just getting started again and just reigniting a spark that, you know, like after this, I'm going I'm going back to guitar lessons. I mean, I oh, love it. Oh, that's great. Just like as if I was a kid again. So you can pick up your copy of the book. Uh, link is in the, uh, in the show notes as well. And Susan, thank yeah. you so much for coming thank by. You. It's been thank a little since I saw I you. I know. It's great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. This was really fun. Awesome. All right. Until next time, people. Peace out.